Hello, everyone, and welcome. I hope you are all well and safe. We have a great session in store for you today. Uh, but before we begin, I'd like to first say that our thoughts and prayers are with everyone at this challenging time. We'd also like to extend our heartfelt appreciation to the many first responders and healthcare professionals that are clearly going above and beyond and working so hard to keep everyone safe. Our thanks go out to all of you. By way of introduction, I'm Rodney Sullivan. I am the executive director of the Richard A. Mayo Center for Asset Management here at the University of Virginia Darden School of Business. It is my pleasure to welcome you all here to today's call. The Mayo Center is a center of excellence at Darden with a focus on applied academic research and education. And consistent with that mission, the purpose of this virtual seminar series is to advance the study and practice of asset management uh, through, of course, research and education. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our co-sponsor for this series, the Financial Management Association International. Before we get started, let me share just a few housekeeping items with you all. Um, all participant microphones have been muted and videos are turned off. For those of you having questions for today's speaker, we ask that you please send them to through the Q&A box that's located on the bottom of your screen. And during the presentation, we will collect uh, these Q&As and put them to uh, the speaker, uh, as many of them as we can, as far as time allows. Note that in the coming days, uh, we will post a recording of today's session on the Mayo Center for Asset Management website. Now with that, let's move on to today's program. It is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, Professor Pedro Matos. Pedro is the John G. Family uh, Chair uh, and the Academic Director for the Mayo Center for Asset Management here at Darden. Pedro, uh, over to you. Well, hello everyone. Uh, so happy to kick this off. Um, I see so many familiar names joining us uh, in Zoom this morning through this webinar. I'd like to, in, my role here is to introduce the speaker. For the many academics and practitioners who are joining us, Kim Harvey actually does not need an introduction. Uh, Kim Campbell Harvey is the John um, Paul Stitch Professor of International Business at Duke's University Fukuoka School of Business. He's a partner and senior advisor at Research Affiliates and plays many other roles. As many of you are aware, he served as president of the American Finance Association and edited the uh, top journal, the Journal of Finance. So without further ado, let me turn over to Cam, who will be speaking to us on the economic and financial implications of COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you actually for putting this uh, together. Uh, I think it's really important. There's a lot of uncertainty out there. And the uncertainty is not just the health uncertainty, but the economic uncertainty. Sort of numbers that we're seeing in terms of economic activity are staggering. So my plan is to walk through um, a few slides uh, to begin with, but I won't take much time on that uh, because I really want uh, to devote the majority of the time to answering your questions. So let me just share a screen and talk about the economic and financial implications of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So slideshow, okay. So a little bit of background. Um, I've been calling a recession since uh, June 30th, 2019. So uh, my dissertation, which some of you know about, I discovered that when the yield curve inverts, um, a recession follows. And uh, since the publication of my dissertation in 1986, uh, basically we've had uh, a track record that is perfect. Uh, this is only a model and it could produce a false signal, obviously, uh, but in June, uh, 2019, the yield curve inverted and I forecasted a recession. And I wasn't alone. So um, the Duke uh, University CFO survey that we've been doing for over 20 years, uh, coincidentally, 
uh, in 2019, over 50% of CFOs thought a recession would begin in 2020. However, the expectations were that this would be a minor uh, recession. So think of it as uh, 1991, 92, or 2001, which were fairly minor recessions. And we get hit with uh, COVID-19. Obviously, that's not in any model, and uh, we go into a recession. So uh, the NBER officially dates recessions, and often they take uh, quite a while uh, to do the dating. Sometimes the beginning of the recession is dated after the recession's over. Uh, well, this particular recession is very easy to date. Um, so the peak is February uh, 2020. So this pandemic uh, falls into a category of risk, uh, which is known as systemic risk. Uh, I teach risk management and usually my first lecture, uh, my students brainstorm uh, examples of systemic risk. And many of the examples that they uh, propose uh, are not systemic. And it's a good learning experience. So systemic risk is a type of risk that uh, affects everyone. It's really hard to, to hide from. So think of um, a catastrophic event like uh, an all-out nuclear war between uh, the US and Russia. There's no place to hide. It doesn't matter where you are. You're going to be affected, uh, and the climate uh, would be adversely affected too. So in terms of the, the list of systemic risks, um, one that always comes up is pandemic. And it's actually interesting that, uh, and maybe we'll have time to talk about this, that pandemic is, amongst the systemic risks are is basically one that is the easiest uh, to mitigate. I know it doesn't feel like it right now, but in terms of the other ones, uh, it is the easiest. Okay, number one, people in the media talk about the COVID-19 as being a black swan event. And that's just false. Uh, we've had plenty of experiences with pandemics. So the, the Spanish flu of 1918, um, the death toll around the world on a population adjusted basis was 200 million. And at the time they didn't even know uh, what it actually was. And it's not just an event uh, 102 years ago. We've had plenty of recent events. We had SARS in 2003. I remember during SARS, I was not gonna travel. I did everything by video conference or, uh, or teleconference. That was a significant scare. But there's also MERS, Ebola, HIV. There's a long list here. So this is not a black swan event. The impact of this pandemic uh, definitely looks uh, like a black swan event, but that is the impact of it. The actual uh, type of risk is not a black swan. So every recession uh, has got its own characteristics. And I think it's useful when we start to analyze uh, this particular crisis, uh, we put it in the context of other uh, recessions. So uh, there's been a lot of comparisons drawn to the global financial crisis, which in my opinion is a much different crisis. So the global financial crisis was caused by the mismanagement of financial institutions. So our banks were way over levered and then a relatively uh, minor event caused a catastrophe in the financial system. So think of this as a financial event causing a financial crisis. And we can actually uh, focus on one sector, uh, the banking. Uh, sector. And this is important because uh, the global financial crisis relative to this one is relatively easy to manage. You can put the 25 leaders of the top financial institutions in a room and hand them out um, their bailouts. And bailout was the correct word. It was repugnant at the time that we had to basically give funding to financial institutions that were basically failing in terms of uh, their management. So the COVID-19 uh, uh, episode that we're in right now is better thought of as a, a natural disaster. So think of it as like a hurricane uh, hitting. We can't point our fingers at any particular sector. Um, indeed, there's no structural problem in the economy. In the global financial crisis, there was a problem. 
um, there was a structural problem with our banks. They're acting like hedge funds and they put the entire economy at risk. We can't do that um, right now. So, so this is a type of risk that hits everybody. And another difference is the type of firm that is being hit hard by this crisis. So, so think, of, um, think of restaurants, bars, retail. Uh, they were not hit as hard uh, during the global financial crisis, but it's devastating uh, for them uh, this time around. The global financial crisis was mainly a large corporation a problem whereas the COVID-19 crisis is a small uh, firm problem. And of course, this means that there's a uh, different demographic uh, sort of uh, influences. So the people that are being laid off um, or furloughed today are different um, in terms of their role in the economy than the people that were laid off or furloughed um, in the global financial crisis. So, I said that this is like a natural disaster and it happens very quickly. Um, again, this is another difference with the global uh, financial crisis. The global financial crisis was a slow moving train wreck. So we had no idea when it was going to end. Indeed, the end, uh, the official end of the recession was well after um, uh, the dating was well after uh, the end. And indeed, even after the, uh, the end, uh, unemployment continued to go up. So the peak in unemployment actually happened after the end of the global financial crisis. Our policymakers were, were not convinced that the recession was even over. And that accounts for them holding interest rates at uh, historically low um, rates. So this is different. It happened very quickly. Um, I call it um, the great uh, compression. And what I mean by that is this is last week's initial claims. And you can see the, the histogram of all of the weekly initial claims and the previous maximum number was 695. And the standard deviation of the change in initial claims is only 17,000. And then we get a print of 3.3 million. So it's way out there. So it's historically unprecedented in terms of the speed. So um, yesterday we got another number, which was 6.6 .6 million. So again, you can see that this is um, a very fast moving uh, sort of um, uh, recession. So if you look at the jobs that we've lost in the last two weeks, it's the same as the total number of jobs that were lost during the global financial crisis. So that's what I mean by speed. So what's in store? Well, we've had 10 million um, new additions to unemployment roll in the last two weeks, and it's not going to end there. And the math is really simple to do. There are 30 million people working in restaurants, bars, and retail. So if you think half are gonna lose their job, that's 15 million right there. And then there's another 37 million working in uh, what I call hard hit industries, like uh, air travel. And so um, if we talk about maybe 50% of those, then we are on track uh, to potentially have uh, unemployment of 25%, which would exceed um, the rate that was estimated during the Great Depression. So there is light at the end of the tunnel. And let me explain what I mean by that. So this crisis, the cause is biological. And the solution is biological. So with high confidence, we know that we can develop a vaccine and that removes the cause. So this is again, a, another difference between the global financial crisis and this crisis. The global financial crisis, we just didn't know if it was gonna last for two years, three years, five years or 10 years. There was talk about a prolonged period of, of depression. This is completely different that we know there is a biological solution 
And that solution will likely be available, in my opinion, by the first quarter of 2021. In addition, um, there's discussion about a second wave in the fall. Most people know that during the Spanish flu, more people died during the second wave in the fall than the, the first wave. I think that uh, that risk is substantially mitigated by increased testing by that time and some pharmacological uh, solutions that would mitigate at least the, uh, the worst symptoms of, uh, of the COVID-19. So in my opinion, what we'll see is uh, uh, two very bad quarters, um, which is quarter two and quarter three. Uh, quarter four will be uh, a recovery. And once we've got uh, vaccines, there's no reason that we can't um, get back to work. And while we're seeing these record increases in uh, unemployment, I also believe that we will see record decreases in unemployment. So the key thing is uh, not to do too much damage to the economy in the meantime. So to keep some firms uh, in, in stasis. Uh, and again, this is another difference between this crisis and the global financial crisis. In the global financial crisis, you lost your job at Lehman. You're not going back to work at Lehman Brothers. Lehman Brothers is gone. And many other firms were substantially downsized. So many of the people that are unemployed uh, today, um, a more appropriate uh, word is furloughed, said they fully expect to go back to their job once this is over. And the key thing is to keep uh, these small and medium sized businesses actually um, alive so they can awaken and go back uh, to their job. Okay, let me briefly talk about the monetary and fiscal uh, responses. We've got a timeline in the slides that are shared on the website. Um, the first move was kind of the standard move where we cut interest rates by 50 basis points. I was not too enthusiastic about that. The rates were already low. Um, at the beginning of the global financial crisis, um, we had a 50 basis point rate cut, but rates were 5.25%. So for me, 1.5 is already low, and I thought that that was uh, largely unnecessary. The, um, the second thing is the uh, New York Fed um, announcing uh, substantial support for the repo market. Next, uh, the Fed cuts interest rates to zero and also announces a program to buy treasuries and to buy um, agencies, 700 billion at minimum. And the word minimum was uh, very important. So then um, the Fed actually uh, starts to do these tricks that they did in the global financial crisis. The Fed can, uh, by law, only uh, buy treasuries and agencies to support other markets. They have to create special purpose vehicles and they announced a series of actually six of them, um, but they weren't all announced at the same time. First one was for commercial paper. Um, then there was a money market uh, uh, fund um, uh, backup. Uh, dollar swap lines were increased. Um, and uh, a number of new uh, central banks were brought in uh, in terms of the swap lines. March 23rd was a very important day because the Fed says there's no limit on the QE. So they'll do what they have to do. So it sounds like what uh, Draghi said uh, with the, uh, the European um, Central Bank. So they also introduced uh, some new facilities for corporate credit in the primary market, in the secondary market. Uh, they resurrected the TALF program, which dealt with student loans, autos, and uh, credit cards. Um, and all of these, all, all of these backstopped um, by the Treasury because the Fed can't take any uh, losses. So the Treasury is backstopping this with um, the Exchange Stabilization Fund. And each of these initiatives had an initial uh, 10 billion of, uh, of backstop. March 23rd also, uh, they announced something called the Main Street Lending Program. And this is a new idea. 
And the idea was to complement the efforts of the Small Business Administration and to have a facility specifically devoted to small and medium-sized businesses. So this is a very good idea, very innovative. Uh, however, there's no term sheet for it and uh, probably won't be operational for another uh, two weeks from, from now. Um, obviously, uh, these backstops are coming from the Treasury. They're not sufficient. $10 billion uh, for each of these initiatives is not sufficient. The, uh, the Exchange Stabilization Fund has less than $100 billion in it. So the Treasury needed to recharge that. And then we get into the fiscal response. So the fiscal response is a total of $2 trillion, as you know. Uh, it includes um, a half a trillion dollars for business grants and loans, and in particular, $450 billion to go to the Treasury's Exchange Stabilization Fund. This is very important because this is the backstop for all of these uh, Fed initiatives. We get an expansion of unemployment insurance, um, hospitals get money, uh, there's direct aid to small business, um, and uh, initially the president announced $50 billion, but in this bill it goes to $367 billion. Um, this uh, program is actually executed by banks, but there's oversight by the Treasury and the Small Business uh, Administration. But there's obviously other things in this bill. It's 880 uh, pages. Uh, there's $220 billion of uh, tax breaks. But in the bottom line, um, the question is, is it enough? It is historically very large. Obviously, it's larger than the global financial crisis. Um, and notice nobody calls this a bailout. Right? In the global financial crisis, it was a bailout of, of banks. So in this particular situation, uh, we don't have the structural problem, as I mentioned. These are good firms. And it's more of a, a way to bridge, to provide some continuity so that when uh, we get the all clear, uh, people can actually go back to work. And one issue is like, is it enough? And it's hard to tell, but we can look at uh, some of the countries. And well, two trillion seems like a lot. Uh, Germany um, has fired the bazooka. So they've allocated 20% of their uh, GDP uh, for this particular effort. So the US uh, with the two trillion, is it enough? Uh, probably not. Can we go back uh, to Congress? Probably. And indeed, I think it's easier to go back to Congress because we know that this crisis will end with a biological solution. And more difficult to go back to Congress during the global financial crisis when they don't know if this is going to last for another five years and they want to be uh, conservative. So, um, as I said, um, I call this a great uh, compression. And let me end up with a little bit of uh, good news. So people talk about the shape of this, uh, this particular episode. Is it going to be a V shape? Is it gonna be a U shape or the dreaded L shape where in the worst scenario, uh, we would have uh, a lost decade? I really don't think we're going there. And indeed, uh, I thought it was very positive uh, in terms of the PMI that came out um, in China where we saw a historic uh, drop in China um, that's on this graph that you can see and take a look at the snapback. So I don't think it's gonna be a V shape I definitely don't think it's, a, uh, it's an L. I think there's a possibility of a skinny U. So not a regular U, but a skinny U, where we'll see a substantial uh, recovery in the fourth quarter, and the first quarter will be uh, pretty robust. And after that, um, we could literally be back on track. Of course, our, our world has changed. Um, there will be uh, so, sort of permanent changes in terms of allocation of resources. Uh, we now know that this risk um, could come back uh, in another form, and we need to invest in technologies to uh, do uh, systemic risk management. And as I said, uh, pandemics are something that can be managed. The risk can be mitigated, uh, but we need to be ready. Obviously, we weren't ready. There are plenty of warnings, um, but uh, sometimes it takes a crisis to um, move forward and try to mitigate the risk 
of the next one. So let me uh, kind of leave it there. And um, I do have um, a bunch of podcasts on my webpage and um, lots of interesting material. Uh, follow me on LinkedIn where almost every day I post something uh, new. So I will stop the sharing now and I'll be very um, interested in hearing your questions. Thanks, Cam. Thanks for a great presentation. I've definitely learned a lot myself. So Thanks. we're now turning here. The question. Are you hearing me, Cam? Okay, that's interesting. No audio. Okay, we'll wait for, for that. Cam, can you hear us now? I can, I can hear you now. Oh, perfect. All right. So I'm thanking you for the presentation. Definitely learned a lot, a lot myself. I'm turning to Q&A and we're receiving a lot of questions. Not sure we'll get to all of them. Just to remind everyone, there's a Q&A box located at the bottom of the screen and these questions are get collated and they sent, get sent to me. Um, so let's start with the biological aspect. You said the crisis is biological and solution is biological. Um, you've been posting a lot of uh, resources on your LinkedIn, as you said, and even set up a web page and have a, a a COVID-19 daily forecast tool. So I, I want you to tell us a little bit about that. Uh, where would you uh, see the, the inflection or sort of plateau points? Um, and what do you think about different vi viral response efforts uh, in, in the US, different parts of the US and other countries? That would be the first question. Yeah, so it's really uh, interesting that you ask a, a finance guy um, a question that should be directed to an epidemiologist. So indeed, indeed um, I was very frustrated uh, given that we've got data from many different countries and different countries kind of starting before the US that surely we could uh, learn from that. So I guess everybody's become an amateur epidemiologist and um, that's kind of motivating uh, the website that I put together uh, with my student, uh, Maury uh, Elsapine. And um, it basically does all the countries in the world, states, um, county level data, and fits a very standard curve that's used in epidemiology called a Richards curve. And uh, because I did this, again, because I was frustrated that we didn't have transparency uh, that the models were not being shared. And it's only recently that we've got some information. Indeed, the administration still hasn't shared their model. So we don't know exactly what it is. We know it's similar to the University of Washington model, which is similar to my model. Uh, there's a few differences. And one difference is that uh, the University of Washington model uh, is informed by the experience in China. And I chose not to do that because I wasn't sure about the quality of the data. So uh, the, given that this is um, uh, a financial crisis and a health crisis caused by a biological event, it makes sense that if you're in finance, you need to harness a, a new type of, um, of data source. And that data source is um, the, new, the reported new cases and unfortunately deaths. Um, as you mentioned, there are two very important things that need to happen. One is uh, the inflection point. And let me just uh, comment on that uh, briefly because the media talks about one inflection point. Indeed, there's uh, a nice uh, graphical depiction today in the New York Times. And uh, the media talks about an inflection point where the rate of new cases start to decrease. And that's not what I focus on. So uh, it, to me, it's no big deal if the rate of new cases goes from 100% to 99%. That's not really reassuring. So the inflection point I care about is when the number of new cases starts to decrease. That's the important point. So these models are very difficult to fit. They're nonlinear. There's not that much data, uh, but it's reasonable given the experience in these other countries to forecast the inflection point uh, is probably within the range of one to three weeks uh, away. Uh, again, these models are difficult to fit, and, uh, but it's important in terms of if you're in finance to know that because that's going to be psychologically uh, very important. The other point that's uh, important is the plateau point, and that's what 
what is the date whereby the way I define it, uh, that you have 90% of the total uh, reported cases. So those two points are important in terms of um, getting some of the uncertainty uh, resolved. A lot of this is just uncertainty. And again, I was um, annoyed uh, to say the least that our policymakers were not sharing their best forecasts. And um, I thought that if those forecasts were available, at least we'd have something to talk about in terms of uh, structure. And I will turn to lots of questions also on the economic front. Um, so as you showed us the initial jobless claims hitting 6 million, uh, showing sort of the depth and breadth of, the, of this contraction. Uh, so the questions where I'm receiving are, how deep is the com contraction? What factors can work against a fast recovery? Other questions um, you know, will be how, will there be lingering effects, uh, particularly on small businesses that fail, change habits, et cetera. Um, and ultimately the government sort of facing a trade-off here of the lives lost to COVID and the economic collapse. And um, so those, those are the questions on the economic side. I'll, I'll let you choose which, which one you, you'd like to speak to. Yeah, let me talk about the, the economic trade-offs first. Um, and actually, uh, I think we should defer the other uh, trade-off that's better for a policymaker uh, to comment on mm -hmm. um, than, than me. So, um, so this is uh, the sort of trade-off that we face. So remember I said that $350 billion of uh, loans have been made available through the banks um, that are overseen by the Small Business Administration and Treasury. So, um, these loans, uh, there will be hundreds of thousands of applications. Uh, this is not like the global financial crisis where you write uh, 25 checks. There's hundreds of thousands of applications. So you need to do this in a way to maximize the speed to which people get the bridge financing. So that means you need uh, the company to fill out a form and sign off on it. And the Small Business Administration or the Treasury shouldn't require the bank to do due diligence on every single one of the numbers that the loan um, applicant uh, kind of fills in. If you do that, it's just not going to work. It's going to take months, if not over a year, uh, to get these loans out. So that's a trade-off because we know that some people will apply that don't really need the loan. We know that some people will misrepresent the information. We know that some businesses will uh, find a way uh, to line their own pockets with it. But that's a cost we need to bear because the larger cost is the delay. If we delay, that means that once we get the all clear, these people can't go back to work because the firm doesn't exist. Okay, and that's really important. Um, the other thing is that these small and medium-sized businesses are crucial for global supply chains. We don't usually notice them. Uh, we notice the end retailer like Walmart, but throughout the chain, uh, these firms are really important. And if we lose these firms, then it's going to take a longer period of time uh, to get um, the engine running um, at full efficiency uh, again. So this is why speed is very important. So again, uh, this crisis is a, a compressed crisis, which means the policy responses need to be compressed uh, also. It's very important. In terms of the things that could slow us down, uh, and I don't think that will be exactly back where we were in the first quarter of 2021. That's naive because of three uh, basic factors. Um, number one, people have lost income. Um, that's just a fact. Um, so GDP will decrease and think of GDP as, as income. And number two, uh, people have gone into debt. So, or, or will go into debt. So that will change your behavior. And number three is probably the least important, uh, and that is the wealth effect. So we know the stock market has gone down dramatically. Um, I think that that is less important for um, the vast number of people that, um, 
that have been put out of work um, in that maybe they have a modest 401k, they've got a long horizon, uh, and that's really not going to change their, their behavior uh, that much. So there are definitely things that can slow us down. The key thing right now, given that there is this credible end uh, in terms of the biological event, it is incumbent upon our policymakers to allow um, for us to get through this, um, to put some firms in stasis so that they can, as I said earlier, reawaken. Um, and, and if we fumble and cause significant disruption, and what I mean by that is you've got high quality firms before this natural disaster, high quality firms doing good work, good margin, good jobs. If they go under, then that's a real loss for the economy in the long term. In the global financial crisis, uh, some of the firms did go under and good riddance. Um, but in this one, it's just so many. There are just so many and they weren't offside. So these firms were operating um, uh, efficiently before and just got blindsided um, by a natural disaster. Great. So let me turn to the free fiscal front in terms of mitigating this um, great compression, as you as you called it. Um, one question we I have here is: Can the U.S. really afford the two trillion stimulus? Uh, you said countries in Europe were doing more. Uh, you pointed to. Germany as an example, and as percentage of GDP, et cetera. But is there a political uh, problem here of, uh, you know, as to whether this is sustainable and what other tools, I, I, another question is what other fiscal tools could be used uh, beyond the ones you've outlined? So this is an excellent point. Um, indeed, Germany fired the bazooka 20% of their GDP um, because they could afford to do it. Mm -hmm. they've, been, they've been frugal. They've been kind of the model case uh, of, of Europe. So they think of uh, this as uh, they're willing to, to spend their, uh, their rainy day uh, reserve. Uh, so that's definitely not what happened in the U.S. So in the U.S., uh, we had a recovery from the global financial crisis that lasted over 10 years. Okay, so it's the longest one on record, the longest one uh, going back to the 1850s, 10 years of sustained growth, yet we ran deficits um, every single uh, year. So, and just increase the, uh, the national debt. So yeah, we have uh, less room uh, to maneuver in terms of the debt front. However, um, there are a number of other factors. So number one, even though people are obviously concerned with the level of debt in the US, the level of debt uh, compared to our GDP is not as bad as some other countries. And I hate to use the, uh, the comparison to Japan, um, but uh, Japan's debt is more than double uh, their GDP. And the US started off at a little less um, than the GDP. Um, that we have uh, today. So uh, you could argue that there is uh, some room uh, to do this. Uh, and then number two, uh, the US is in this very special position in that the currency is the de facto numerator currency in the world. So, and the treasury bonds are the de facto safe haven uh, in the world. So that allows for uh, special status. And of course, the US is the economic engine driving world growth. Yeah, it's true that the size of US GDP compared to world GDP is, has declined, but it's not just the size. Uh, the, the US has a very important role to play in world economic growth and in just the general area of innovation. So, so I think that the U.S. is in good shape, uh, given that uh, they uh, the, there's a safe haven uh, sort of aspect to this. It should be straightforward um, to raise additional funding uh, if uh, it's needed. Great, thank you. On the, on the monetary policy front. Um, what is possible for the Fed to do in terms of rates? So, in, do you think we are 
and you, you've pointed Japan on the fiscal side, Japan on the monetary side, uh, people have pointed to this liquidity trap uh, Japan's been on and we're reaching also this zero bound uh, in, in the US now. So what do you think is possible for the Fed uh, could do? So again, I, and let's be fair here. Um, our policymakers can make mistakes. You can't get everything right. Uh, so, and, and I have been critical of the rate cuts. I didn't think that they were uh, actually necessary. And the danger is that we fall into a liquidity trap. And let me just explain what I mean by that. Um, so in, in Japan, uh, the only buyer of the Japanese government bond is the Bank of Japan. That market's gone. And we actually saw uh, just, uh, uh, it's 10 days ago, uh, the situation where the 10-year bond, the rate got so low, like 0.4%, and the 30-year bond was at 0.9%, that people start to realize, well, maybe this long-term bond isn't really a safe haven. And it's not that the U.S. is going to default. It's that if rates went up, you're at severe risk. So that 30-year bond, if rates go up 1%, you lose 20% of the value. So why should I hold um, the 30-year bond at 0.9% when I can hold a treasury bill uh, at you know, 0.1%? So essentially, that's exactly what we saw. Um, and that's why, that's why uh, the government uh, or the Fed is out there uh, buying the, the longer-term bonds. And um, it's a basic situation where the rates are so low that it's really hard to uh, interest people in bond-based financing. So it affects everything. It affects the economy. It affects um, our ability to, to fund projects, uh, to hire, to, uh, to grow our GDP. So, so I certainly hope that we don't go to a Japan-like situation or even a Europe situation where you've got, in Denmark, I shared this article where you get a mortgage with a negative rate. So you get paid every month for taking the mortgage. I don't think we want that. That's really distortionary. Um, the rates have been unusually low for, for too long. Um, you mentioned the zero lower bound. You know, the rates can go negative, but they can't go negative uh, too much because at some point uh, people will just hoard cash because the cash has got a, a zero, a rate of return. So cash is actually costly. There is, um, you have to vault it, um, but uh, I certainly hope that we uh, don't get there. The Fed has done a lot of innovative things. The favorite thing that uh, I like is this um, Main Street uh, facility that they've announced on March 23rd and hopefully be operational in a couple of weeks. That was a good idea. And that really uh, told me that they recognized that this was a different type of crisis. Initially, I was critical saying, oh, well, the, the, the Fed's doing the same things as the global financial crisis when this is not a crisis of, of banks. Um, they need to do something that recognizes that this crisis is different. You need a new playbook. And this was a really good example of something innovative that uh, was focused on, on small and medium-sized businesses. And that's where I think uh, the main problem is. We are we're also getting a lot of questions markets related, one on the stock market, but also on terms you pointed to whether treasuries were the safe haven or not. And some folks are emailing um, questions, um, whether the fixed income markets might be in more trouble or than, <laughs> than equity markets. Uh, and I, I know you've done a lot of research also on gold and cryptocurrencies and sort okay. of uh, whether they would provide a hedge. So wh where, is the he where is the safe haven? And uh, before we turn into other questions, I'm curious to- Yeah, yeah no, sure. That's uh, a good question. So let's, um, let's talk about um, the stock market first. So I've looked at other kind of situations where we've had um, pandemic scares uh, and 
1918, there's almost no movement in the stock market. Even though the U.S. lost more people, six times more people, to the Spanish flu than they lost in World War I. But 1918 was confounded by a very important fact, and that was World War I was over. Okay, so you got the boost from kind of like a peace dividend, uh, and you really didn't see a negative movement in the market. Uh, 2003 is uh, the SARS, as I mentioned. Uh, first outbreak was in November, but really didn't start um, to be noticed until uh, 2003. And again, there's very little movement in the market. However, the market was already in a drawdown. The, the market was already down 45% from the peak. So it, to me, it's not really surprising uh, that there wasn't that much uh, negative action in the market. Whereas this particular crisis, um, we're at an all-time high, February 19th. So it just seemed like there was a lot of room uh, to actually uh, move down. So I, so I think that that, uh, that that is important to take uh, into account, just kind of the level uh, of, of valuation. If I may stay with stock markets for a while, uh, some questions on circuit breakers. Some countries in Europe have short sales bans. Uh, if I recall this correctly, Italy, Spain, France. Some point to ETFs and, and sort of uh, that as well. Um, how, you know, how should we think about the, the, the market environment and this increased volatility? Sure. How, yeah, no, these are all, um, these are all uh, good questions. And um, I guess I, I've got a strong opinion that the, the ban in short selling basically just takes information away from the market. Uh, we should let markets behave. If, if there's liquidity, then there should be trading. So it's, some people want to sell, some people want to buy, uh, that's fine. Um, and to disrupt that uh, has, I think, a lot of negative uh, effects on the information flow uh, in markets. Uh, you also asked me about gold. Um, I've done research on gold. Um, my Sorry. favorite called the, the golden dilemma. And mm -hmm. gold is great because you have such a long history of gold. Uh, uh, but gold is uh, volatile and it is an unreliable hedge. So in, in my paper, I say, well, gold can be a hedge, but the holding time is very long, longer um, longer than we think of in terms of long term, like centuries. So, uh, and gold has retained its value over uh, millennia, but uh, you can see wild fluctuations. So it's unreliable, and I guess the out of sample evidence kind of validates it. Uh, gold didn't um, provide a hedge uh, in this uh, particular crisis. It's not down as much as the stock market, but nevertheless. Um, and uh, cryptocurrencies, I teach um, a course called Innovation in Crypto Ventures at Duke University. And um, I get this question all the time. Um, well, are cryptocurrencies a, a hedge because they're not linked to any fundamental, right? So these other uh, assets are, are linked to fundamentals in the economy. This is just a, a computer program. So I say all along, number one, we don't know because we never had a recession when there's been a cryptocurrency. And then number two, um, given the nature of trading, the extreme volatility, 100% annualized volatility, it's hard to think of any hedge that's got 100% annualized volatility. That just doesn't make any sense. Um, but what we found out during uh, this uh, current crisis is they're just a risk asset. Right, so what happened to the value of cryptocurrencies went down 50%, that's no hedge. So it was a risk off trade, people dumping stocks, buying bonds, dumping cryptocurrencies, dumping credit, all these things. So just pure risk off and um, so definitely uh, not a hedge. And another type of question, we we're up to 80 questions by now, so there's no way we get to them, but uh, one question or sort of questions is how China is integral, uh, how the crisis is sort of showing that China is integral to world supply chains, to economic growth. You, um, what do you think, you know, more broadly, perhaps, uh, are the implications of COVID for the globalization period we 
you know, we were all in and, uh, and uh, what sort of role China would be playing forward. So I do think, again, that we will learn uh, some lessons uh, from this crisis. So, um, and, and I think that our, our policymakers have realized that, oh, well, maybe it's not a good idea if all of the um, medical supplies are sourced in one country. And I'm not talking about PPE, but I'm not, I'm talking more about like certain uh, drugs. So, so I think that uh, it, it is a trade-off. Um, it's a risk management trade-off. So it might be that the cheapest possible drugs that you can get are from one particular country. But in terms of risk management, you need to have multiple uh, sourcing. Mm -hmm. So if something like this did happen uh, again, we can't rely upon any one country. So that is a cost. It's an insurance cost. And uh, it means that things would be uh, more expensive, but think of that as paying an insurance premium. So I do think that we'll take a look at globalization and uh, take a look at it from a risk management uh, perspective. And uh, I think some trade-offs will be made. We're not going to go back uh, to where we were. It'll take a while uh, to do that evolution. Do I think all trade is gonna stop? Obviously not. Uh, we will carry on, but we will carry on in a way that is cognizant of the type of risk exposures that uh, we face when we rely upon just one or two sources. Great. And other large lessons we can learn from this crisis? And, you know, I'm curious your thoughts on, on those. What can we take away? What are we learning with this crisis compared to others? Um, well, part of this crisis is a result of the lack of risk management. So in finance, uh, we talk about this a lot. Um, we identify the risks um, and we come up with strategies to mitigate those risks. And, and obviously, there are trade-offs. So to, for a company to be completely hedged, maybe they need to buy uh, a large amount of put options on the S&P 500. That's just not feasible. People are not going to do that. Um, but there are certain things that will happen. So I think that um, this is, given it's a realized risk, uh, more companies will take this type of risk uh, seriously. Um, they will have... Uh, backup plans like they've never had uh, before. The government will also, my guess, uh, provide funding for biotech research to a scale that we've never seen before. I, I, I think it's uh, analogous to uh, what happened with Sputnik, where the U.S. realized that they were behind in something that is very important in terms of economic um, growth. So we will see a lot of government resources um, devoted to developing um, vaccines for the next one that can be deployed uh, very quickly. Um, that comes with a trade-off also because of the limited amount of funding. It means that other important areas will be likely underfunded. So as we kind of switch our focus, uh, we will have gee, after um, the recessions that were induced by um, oil shocks, oil embargo, um, our uh, policymakers came up with a great idea to have a strategic petroleum reserve. Well, I'm pretty sure we're going to have something analogous in terms of uh, a strategic medical equipment reserve. There's a, like a small one that exists today, but um, it's pretty well depleted already. So I think that that's another uh, sort of thing uh, that will happen. So uh, there are many uh, lessons uh, to learn uh, from this uh, crisis. The crisis is not over yet. Uh, as I said, I'm, I'm hopeful that this can be a skinny uh, U-shape. Uh, there will be reforms. Unfortunately, and this is kind of the way it works, um, you have to have a horrible uh, crisis in order to make some progress uh, in terms of reforms that should have been in place uh, before. 
And uh, this is not, uh, and please don't interpret this as a, a critique, uh, a political critique uh, whatsoever of one particular administration. I think that if this uh, COVID-19 hit uh, any of the previous administrations, it would be uh, a very difficult situation uh, for, for any of them. The, the point is that this is a realization of systemic risk. We should be better at doing risk management. We had plenty of warnings about this. Uh, they weren't listened to. Now, in hindsight, they'll be listened to and there will be some mitigation. As I said, right at the beginning, um, a uh, pandemic uh, type of uh, situation amongst all of the systemic risks is the one that's most easily mitigated. And I think we've got some ideas as to how to actually do that. Great. So with that, I, we're coming to the hour here. So we reached a record on uh, tenants over 600 at one time, questions over 90 by now. Uh, thank you so much, Cam, uh, for your time and your insights today. And thanks to all the listeners and participants and for your great questions. I hope you found today's session helpful to your daily lives. Before we close, I want to mention that we, uh, the Mayo Center is organizing a virtual seminar series, and this is continuing on Friday, April 17, at the same time slot, 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, we have another special guest, Andrew Caroli from Cornell, uh, and then the following week on April 24, we have Maureen O'Hara also from Cornell. We are confirming a few more for early May and we'll announce those on our website, which is www.darden.virginia.edu slash Mayo Center. I wanted to thank the Darden and the Mayo team here. So ASME, the tech uh, person on, on the call today, you were awesome. Rodney, Aaron, Ali from the Mayo Center, and my colleagues, Mark Clipson, who you can also see on the call, and Rich Evans, um, who will be also moderating some of the future calls. So thanks again. Stay safe and well. And I look forward to see you all on April 17. Thank you. <laughs>